The internet might change with the new Biden administration. A lot less snooping, a lot more reliability, maybe. A lot's going to depend on our, uh, on our public pressure and action right now, particularly calling three senators. Check this out, this uh, interview with Evan Greer. Uh, leave your comments, ding the bell, share it with your friends, and subscribe to our channel. On the line with us is Evan Greer, the deputy director of Fight for the Future, which is... Uh, Oh, hang on just a second here. Let me put Evan on the line. My apologies, Evan. Uh, Fight for the Future it has been working on net neutrality in a huge way. Evan, Evan has been a guest on our program many times. Fightforthefuture.org is their website. Uh, the Twitter handle is Fight for the FTR. And uh, Evan, Ajit Pai has just announced that he's on his way out. The, the commissioner of the FCC that Trump uh, put in the top job. Uh, the guy who kind of shepherded through the end of net neutrality so that right now, uh, you know, if Comcast Corporation wants to know everything I do on the Internet, every email I send, uh, every every uh, online uh, transaction I engage in, uh, they have access to all that information and they can even sell it, I believe, without my knowledge. I, you know, and uh, please correct me if I'm wrong. Um, that what That's in part what the end of net neutrality means. Um, number one, give us a quick primer primer on uh, on net neutrality and you know how how we lost it and how we might get it back. And then secondly, you know what what does the future of the FCC look like in your opinion? Yeah, sure thing. Thanks for having me back on the show, Tom. Um, you know, so quickly, uh, you know, you're you're right that Aji Pai has uh, announced that he will be stepping down from the FCC, uh, which certainly should be cause to celebrate. Uh, Pai was, uh, you know, arguably perhaps one of the worst uh, public officials in modern history, uh, just so blatantly corrupt. And as you mentioned, perhaps his greatest policy accomplishment, if you can call it that, was repealing the net neutrality protections that millions of people from across the political spectrum fought for and won under the Obama administration. And, and one of my personal pet peeves is a lot of reporters will call these you know, Obama era rules. But the reality is we had to fight tooth and nail to get Obama's uh, FCC chair, Tom Wheeler, who was also a former industry insider, to enact those strong rules in the first place. Now, Pi essentially blew them up and in doing so, um, not only gutted those bright line net neutrality rules, but basically kneecapped the Federal Communications Commission as an agency that can provide basic oversight of these telecom monopolies like Comcast and Verizon and AT&T. You know, the example you gave was sort of a bit about privacy, which certainly does fall under the FCC's jurisdiction in some cases. But the primary rules that we're talking about here were against uh, companies abusing their monopoly power to slow down or block websites, pick and choose what we can see and do on the Internet. Uh, and essentially, uh, you know, these are rules that prevent our cable company from deciding what content we can see, um, which I think right, is something so, that so right now, the Evan, political spectrum can agree on. Yeah, if, if Comcast, uh, my, as my Internet service provider, wanted to pull a Google, um, this, is, this is what almost killed uh, Alternate.org, you know, one of the major progressive websites, was uh, Google decided we're no longer going to include them in our searches, and, uh, you know, you have to specify that site if you want to see any information from Alternate, and, and we're no longer going to consider them news. Um, and this was all basically because they were simply progressive. I mean, there were, to the best of my knowledge, there weren't specific examples of fake news on alternate. But it, it so kneecapped that organization that they ended up uh, dissolving, essentially, their original corporate structure. It was a nonprofit and selling the, the website to, to a good progressive entrepreneur. But still, you know, it killed the website. It killed their traffic. So right now, Comcast could, in my home, in my in in the in the modem in my home essentially or or through the modem in my home they could say uh, yeah alternate daily Kos, democratic underground if you try to go to any of those websites you're going to have to count to 10 before they before they come up but if you go to daily caller or redstate.com it will load instantly do i have that right yeah you have that more or less right and i think you know the the examples that you're giving around sort of politically motivated um, censorship or suppression are certainly loom large as concerns. Uh, I think we should also always just be on the lookout for good old fashioned corporate greed. Uh, it may be less that Comcast is deciding, all right, we're going to slow down lefty websites and speed up right wing websites. It's more likely they're going to say, hey, anybody who doesn't give us money, you get slowed down. 
right? Um, so it's very much about mm. them kind of, uh, you know, setting up toll roads on the Internet, abusing their monopoly power. But again, I think it's also critical to understand how important this is right now in the middle of a pandemic, right? So many people are uh, working from home, sending their kids to school online. We are more vulnerable to abuse from our Internet service providers than ever before in history. And the agency that is supposed to protect us, that's supposed to work in the public interest, has been asleep at the wheel during the entire Trump administration. We now have an opportunity to finally uh, get some basic leadership back in that agency, put them back on the beat, um, protecting the public from companies like Comcast and Verizon and AT&T. But unfortunately, we're seeing a cynical play from Senate Republicans who are trying to ram through the nomination of uh, a totally unqualified staffer that was nominated by President Trump. It's an unprecedented move to try to rush through his nomination before the president leaves office. And if they succeed in doing it, basically they'll kneecap the agency at a 2-2 tie uh, that could basically tie their hands for up, for up to two years, preventing them from undoing the damage that Pai did, preventing them from restoring net neutrality. You know, in normal times, this would be regular Republican obstructionism. During a pandemic, when people are so desperate and so vulnerable, I would argue that this is just criminal, uh, deeply unethical. They're not owning the libs or sticking it to the Biden administration. They're just hurting working families and kids who are sitting outside of Taco Bell to try to do their homework. Yeah. And, and I'm guessing that these Republicans are getting some substantial campaign contributions from these big Internet service providers. Um, have you looked into that? I'm, I'm guessing a lot of that sure, is yeah. on OpenSecrets.org. Absolutely. I mean, the reality is that these you know, big telecom companies have given money hand over fist to both major political parties, both Democrats and Republicans. Um, you know, fortunately, um, you know, thanks to the massive amount of Internet activism that we've done over the last number of years, Democrats have largely fallen in line um, in supporting uh, Title II, strong net neutrality protections. Um, Republicans in Washington, D.C. have largely continued to oppose it. But it's important to remember that with voters outside of the Beltway, 80 percent of voters from across the political spectrum, including more than 75 percent of people that voted for Donald Trump, um, oppose the FCC's repeal of net neutrality. Again, if there's one thing that we can all agree on from the furthest left to the furthest right, it's that our cable and phone company shouldn't decide what we can do on our phones and on our computers. Um, that should be up to us, uh, not to those companies that connect us to the Internet. Yeah, it's, it's the equivalent of uh, back in the day, if AT&T was to listen in on my conversation and say, oh, yeah, he's, he's talking to his mother. Uh, we'll charge him two cents a minute for that. Oh, he's talking to his stockbroker. Well, we'll charge him 30 cents a minute for that. Do I have that right? Yeah, more or less. Or another way to think of it is, you know, you buy a toaster, uh, you know, or the electricity in your house will power a toaster regardless of which company you buy it from. Your electric company can't tell you, oh, you have to buy our preferred toaster. Uh, you know, the electricity does what you want it to do. You can plug whatever you want into it. Uh, I think that's another sort of analogy here. Um, and right. to quickly just say where we're at with this play in the Senate, you know, I think everybody should be contacting their senators generally, telling them to oppose this nomination of Nathan Symington uh, to uh, stack the deck at the FCC. But particularly if you live in Maine, Alaska uh, or Louisiana, your senator, Republican senators, broke ranks with their party and voted against the repeal of net neutrality. They are the most likely senators to do the right thing here, uh, break ranks with the party again, and block this nomination of Nathan Symington. So if you know anyone in Maine, Alaska, or uh, uh, Louisiana, encourage them to call Senator Susan Collins, Senator Lisa Murkowski, Senator Kennedy, tell them to block the nomination of Nathan Symington so the FCC can get back to work protecting the public and you, restoring net neutrality. You've got it, Evan. And the number to call to reach your, your senator is 202-224-3121. Evan Greer, Deputy Director of Fight for the Future, Fight for the